Welcome everyone to REBT Works, where we discuss everything that has to do with REBT. I'm Dr. Steve Johnson, and it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest for today, a guest unlike any that we've had so far, and I think that you're going to be really edified by what he has to share about that life. Um, um, his name is Mr. Jimmy McPhee, and I will call him Jimmy, as I say, no disrespect, uh, Jimmy, to, to that whatsoever. Um, so My friends call me Jimmy. <laughs> okay, doke. Um, so, Jimmy, do you mind just kind of, you do have a powerful story, and if, if you could just jump into that story and give us a feel for what your life has uh, been like up until the last year. Certainly will. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to share uh, God's uh, grace and mercy in my life, but I want to first uh, begin with, most stories have a title, and mine is uh, not unlike others. I like to call it Voices and Choices, and I think you'll see why as I unfold it. But the voices that we listen to determine our choices, and our choices determine our lives. And the first voice that I remember is my father's, actually. Uh, the, the, the voice of my father, a stern one, uh, a strict one, and a, and a tough man. He was a good man, but he was a hard man. Now, you may wonder why I didn't mention my mother's voice first. Well, at 15 months of age, she left with my older sister, basically walked away from my father and myself, leaving my father to raise me. And as I said, he was a good man, but he was a hard man. Uh, he, he, he lived hard, worked hard, provided well, but he also drank hard. He womanized hard. He gambled hard. He lived life hard. He was a World War II vet. Uh, no-nonsense kind of guy, uh, very, I think, morally sound outside of his, uh, his uh, maybe idols he developed in his life, but taught me a lot of lessons I still repeat to this day. His, uh, my, his third wife was my mother, so I would actually, he would be married six times in his life, and I would have subsequently three more stepmothers by the age of 12. Now, that instability in the home and the voices, the loud voices at night, doors slamming, the, uh, just the turbulence of the home. It was uh, very unsettling, especially to a kid. And a kid raised to say, you don't uh, cry. Um, you, when you skin your knee, uh, fall off your skateboard or your bicycle, you don't come home crying. You bite your lower lip and go forward. And that was my dad. Unfortunately, as I learned about the age of 15, uh, bottle up emotions as I watched him do it and I began to do. I like to use kind of the analogy of a, of a liter Coke bottle. If you take the cap off and put your thumb over the top and walk around with it, uh, it has a way of shaking it up. And of course, eventually the thumb comes off and it makes a mess. Well, it's much the same with our emotions. And as I was taught to model up mine and as I watched my father do it, life has a way of shaking you up and eventually the thumb comes off and you make a mess. I watched my father make messes, and then I began to make them. But at the age of 15, by then, I had done well in school. It was, became my sanctuary. My social life was like, was like two different lives I led. I was uh, staying involved with sports. I played football and baseball. Uh, I was an honor roll student uh, up to until about ninth grade, and then I began to drift away, manifesting anger, just bottling up things until it was coming out in a very unhealthy way striking out at fellow players uh, in the school. And then I began to run with an older crowd. You could call it maybe a street crowd. Uh, drinking, smoking marijuana, experimenting with more drugs and attempting to fill a void. Now I can look back in retrospect that I didn't understand then. Trying to fill a void that only a God can fill. And I thought all the devices of the world was the answer. Uh, I, the arrest began to mount. Basically, my life became from one party to another, to one drug deal to another. And as the arrest began to come, one prison cell after another. At the age of 19, I was sentenced to three years in prison for a narcotics violation. I would serve one year of that, of that three. But I didn't get better in, in that time. I got very bitter. Uh, what, watching the wanton violence the need to have to stand up and fight for very meager belongings or you became prey from the predatory life that surrounded you. So you either were a tough guy or you would become prey. And that combined with 
my, my, my tendency to internalize things, I became basically a ticking time bomb released on society one year later. It was four months and seven days after my release, the bomb exploded. I shot one man and, and killed one man and seriously wounded a second one in an armed robbery. For those crimes, I was tried, convicted, and sentenced to die in South Carolina's electric chair. I still remember the words of the judge that day, just a 20 year old kid. Looking back now, I thought I was a tough guy at 20. And uh, looking back now, I was, I was just a child. And I remember standing before the judge and the last word that they uttered by law when they sentenced you to die is may God have mercy upon your soul. I remember turning from the judge that day, angry, because I didn't hear him saying, uh, the courts have any mercy on you, but maybe God will. And I just in my angry state, and I turned to see my father standing in the front row of the courtroom. He seemed to age 20 years in that moment. And it was in that moment that I basically declared war on the world. It was me against everyone. And that's what ruled my life for many years to come. But before I get ahead of the story, I remember that very same day being uh, escorted to the death row cell, escorted in the cells, the door slammed behind me. The noise is a prison, the smells of prison, the, you can smell the fear and the loneliness and the desperation of a prison cell block. All those things hitting me at once and then looking at my, the prison cell with a little dim light in the corner of the room, a, a graffiti covered walls and uh, a, a combination sink and, and, and a toilet was basically my new home. And the space of it, the area was, I could walk five paces in turn. I know I measured them and then walk them for, for years to come. Five paces in turn, five paces in turn. That's where I would think, I would look back over my life, ask myself questions like, Jimmy, how'd you get here? I didn't have any answers. I knew what I'd done was wrong, but I didn't understand the whys of it. It would be years later before I come to understand the internalized anger, the lack of the moral breakdown over time from listening to the wrong voices of the world until at last hearing the voice of that judge sentenced me to death row. So how do I get from honor roll student to death row? Uh, many poor choices listen to many of the wrong voices. I continue to do that even while in prison. On death row, I struck out at fellow inmates. When guards mm -hmm. attempted to in, inter, intervene, I would attack them, just angry, striking out. But by the grace of God, I did not recognize then. Three and a half years later, I was sentenced, resentenced from death to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole in 10 years. Now, most agreed, and they told me to, to a man that you got your life back, Jimmy, and you have a parole date, but your chances of ever seeing the outside again are pretty much nil. You've got your life back and from uh, the grace of getting your, uh, not being executed. But what they gave me back for my life was Central Correctional Institution, what they call CCI in Columbia, South Carolina. And at that time, it was the most dangerous prison in South Carolina, one of the most dangerous in the southeast of America. Over 2,000 inmates, if you can imagine, packed in cell blocks designed for 600. It was people on top of people. Uh, I thought the violence of my first prison stay was bad, but now it's a whole new world. Many of them didn't have any, much like I didn't live hopeless, aimless, reckless, didn't care. And when you're surrounded by 2,000 more, much in the situation I was like anything goes. Uh, including all morals out the window, survive at any cost. And that became my life for the next 20 years. But what's amazing, the very same thing that I so abhorred in my first sentence, that, I, that I, I found just so despicable, many of the acts that I saw and all that, I became that person over the next two decades in prison. The, the, the hopelessness I felt of 20 years, uh, in that 20 years, I became involved in drug trade in prison. I was a loan shark in prison. I hurt people when they didn't pay me my money. I became all the things that I so despised. And at last, in the early 1990s, almost two decades into my prison time, I assaulted both an inmate and an officer. And for those crimes, I was actually transported to outside court and given 10 more years on my sentence. But that wasn't even the worst of my punishment. They sentenced me what they call supermax. Super maximum security is special buildings I have to 
federal authorities have and most states do to lock away the worst of the worst. And they locked me away for what they told me then was the duration of my prison time. Now I'm serving life. So I don't have to tell you that I was basically sentenced to a, another death sentence in a sense, but this time a slow death, just looking at four walls each and every day. And what I would soon come to understand is those four walls, I didn't need physical walls around me. I was already in prison by anger, by my addictions, by hope, hopelessness, by hatred. I was just engulfed in it all. And uh, I remember uh, I was a reader. I love to read. And there were two books that, that most probably uh, most changed my life. One was a book, first of all, uh, our, our Holy Bible, uh, God's inspired word. And uh, second one is uh, Victor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And that book would change my life. His perspectives, a, a man that was basically sentenced himself, but taken into the death camps of Nazi Germany and watching his family be all, you know, basically executed or worked to death. And I think his sister was the only one who survived the whole thing. And I think she escaped. But my point is this. He observed, he had a keen mind, both a psychiatrist and a medical doctor, and a keen mind for observation. And what he noticed in this tough situation where Nazis had full control over everything, no matter how much control they had, there was always a choice that remained. Because what he saw was there were some people who would act like a saint and give others, put others before themselves, and maybe give them their last little bit of food to extend someone else's life, even at the cost of their own. But then there were the other type. The other type that I had become more like a savage. And they would wait for the other person to get too weak, maybe to mount a fight. And then they would snatch what they had. So the difference there between being a saint and a savage. But that wasn't the point that stood me up straight when I read it. It was the fact that there's always one freedom remains, no matter how much seeming loss of control you have. And that is the freedom to choose your response in that situation. I did not have to continue to be the savage that I had become in 20 years of prison. I did not have to continue to be the person to, to uh, deny other people's their freedoms by exercising my own freedom to be the man that I was created to be and the saint we are that Jesus Christ says, says in scripture. But there was a man, and when I first went to death row 20 years before, who came to my cell passing out library books. I've always been a reader. And uh, he came around and he introduced himself this way. He said, my name is Frankie Song. I love you and Jesus loves you. He doesn't care what crimes you committed. He will forgive you if you let him. Well, I remember those words and they would echo across decades in my life, right up until today, actually. But at the time, I didn't hear him. I wouldn't hear the voice of a man attempting to save my very life, my eternal life. And I thanked him. And he had books, so I was real nice and polite, and I went on my way, and so did he. <clears throat> but uh, 20 years later, after reading Victor Franklin's book, I remember Frankie's song. I sat down and wrote him a letter, and I was able to get to him. He couldn't come to me. Nobody could visit me there where I was. And uh, I dropped him a letter and said, Frankie, I'm in a tough spot. I'm broken. I'm hopeless. I kind of told him about those four walls I just shared with you the hopelessness, uh, even, even the addictions, uh, different things, anger. And uh, he wrote me back and verbatim, he said, I love you and Jesus loves you. He doesn't care what crime you committed. He'll forgive you if you let him. Well, I listened to him and we wrote back and forth. Eight and 10 page letters were sometime I would send to him and he would faithfully uh, write back, answer my questions. And I kept, start, began to read the Bible as he encouraged me to do. And this thing called truth kept speaking to me. And just as Pontius Pilate had Jesus stand before him and Jesus, they were going back and forth about, so you're, you're a king then. And of course, Jesus was saying, he just got don't get it. But, you know, uh, I, my, I, my, I came into the world for this, to, to witness to the truth. And anyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Well, that voice, I didn't understand truth, but I think it's best, I think it's best illustrated. I like it Matthew 28 version. And that's when Mary and, and the, uh, the, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to the tomb to dress what they thought was Jesus' body. And there sat on, on a rock was uh, the angel, all in white. 
And they're saying, I can see it now. Where's Jesus? He said, he's not here. He has risen just as he said he would. Billy Graham said the most powerful words ever uttered in the history of mankind, most important words ever uttered. And in that, I understood that just as he rose, I too could rise from that very tomb that I was entombed in then. And that I could come overcome these things that he, over and over it spoke to me in a way that said, you have forgiven. I didn't have to carry the shackles of shame and regret and all the things that weighed me down for so many years. And in that time, in that solitary cell, I continued to read. I gave my life to God, confessed my sins, sat down and cried and tears poured in proportion to all the wrong I'd done, the hurt I watched in my father's eyes, the life I'd taken, uh, the many people I'd hurt along the way. And in that, I found a freedom right there in that solitary cell. See, what Jesus did is knock down those four walls. He turned those four walls into bridges into my future and into relationship with him. I would spend the next five years in solitary confinement after I gave my life to God. For a total of seven years that time and 16 years in solitary confinement out of my first 25 years in prison by the year 2000. And then I was released to the general population again, another act of grace. Never saw coming, and I worked hard, studied very, very, uh, very. I mean, very every day, discipline. I call it three keys to life: discipline, and one of them is physically, mentally, and spiritually every day. Spending quiet time with God every day. I still do it to this moment. And the second key, too, is serve somebody. I became a tutor and a teacher within prison walls for many years to come, and slowly but surely pouring into others, finding my true worth as an individual. And sharing the gifts that God had given me. I was pretty good with math. I liked to write. And I shared to help guys get their GEDs. I became a public speaking instructor. And various other leadership positions. Through very uh, rehabilitation programs. Around the state of South Carolina. Until in the year 2017. I was encouraged. By one of the chaplains. Uh, where I was in the upstate of South Carolina. To apply for, Central, for uh, Columbia International University. Prison Initiative which we could obtain a two-year college degree in Bible, a uh, very stringent process. Actually, only 15 inmates are chosen out of 20,000 inmates in any one year. And by the grace of God, I was able to uh, go through all the rigors of it all. I actually graduated and graduated top of my classes. I used to tell the guys, you know, you guys, are, I, I mean, these are smart guys. They, they pick some good ones, I have to admit, young, smart whips. And I said, you know, you guys can outsmart me. But one thing you can't do, you can't outwork me. And I would work. If I had to read the books twice, that's what I did. <laughs> but in that journey, it was amazing uh, how I grew. People <clears throat> told me I looked like Moses coming out the mountain after that experience of shining, spending so much time with God in that time. And of course, as you know, Steve, you were my instructor for psychology course on the last uh, semester of my time there. And I'd like to share something with you, too. Um, and thank you again for for many of the lessons and the humor that you instill in your teaching too. But you know, when I graduated in uh, December of 2019, they allowed people, visitors to come in from the outside to watch us with our caps and gowns receive our, receive our degrees. And there were two people, there were several supporters I had there, but two in particular I'd like to mention. One was my oldest sister, who uh, after being separated and basically as, when I was a year old, would come back together as a teenager only to have her watch the roller coaster of insanity that was my life for the next 40 years, to be there today, that day to watch me graduate and receive my degree in Bible. And there was another individual there too, a man named Kuzo Maishi, now 91 years old, the man that brought the gospel to a death row cell and then to a solitary confinement cell in Supermax. Frankie Son would be there to watch me receive my Bible degree. I can't tell you how blessed he was, but how blessed I was in knowing that my, my father, uh, basically my adopted father, had been there to watch me become much of the, the godly man that he had become and a teacher and all, many of the things that he had done for over 55 years he devoted in his life to the prison system. And I was the blessed uh, re recipient of 45 of that years of mentoring and growth over time back and forth with this wonderful man. But uh, before I, before I kind of close this part of the, 
this journey here, something I like to share. In December, when I graduated, I was sent out on my mission. Now we're sent out as part of the agreement. We're going to get a, the, the college education. We're, upon signing a contract, we'll give five years of service to the program and the SEDC to be sent out as peacemakers and lights to the darkness to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to stop and think about what I just said. I was now a peacemaker and a light to the darkness. The very same Jimmy McPhee, who 25 years before had locked me away and said, we don't even want you walking our prison yards. Anymore. Only God, only the teaching of Jesus Christ and walking out the principles every day. And there's something I'd like to say. I know this isn't a story of I gave it to Jesus and, and I got out of prison. And, and <laughs> I spent 25 more years in prison after giving my life to Christ. I spent 20 years in prison recklessly. So this isn't a story of, you know, I gave it to God and, you know, the doors opened up. No. But see, understand this. And let me share this. This is very important, I think. The Apostle Paul prayed many wonderful, eloquent prayers over the churches that he built back to the, like Ephesus and et cetera, and, and Colossae. But not once did he pray to God to, to change the circumstances. What he prayed was to change the people within them. And that's precisely what he did with me. My perspective changed from seeing my prison uh, sentences or printed sentence to a prison scholarship from my prison uh, cell to a prison classroom from my perspective of it not being a painful journey, but one of punishment, but one of preparation for what he had for the future. And I stood in the scripture over and over that, that uh, Romans uh, 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those uh, who love God and call according to his purpose. Well, on March the 18th, 2020, three months after I graduated college, I went for the parole board for the 18th time. I had been turned down for 35 years, every two years. My initial real eligibility, 10 years after I went in. And 44 years, nine months and 20 days after I was sentenced to die in the electric chair, the parole board said, Mr. McPhee, your parole has been granted. That was 13 months ago. And what a glorious 13 months it has been. And I think I'll stop there and, and allow you to any questions you may have. Wow, is the, my reaction to that. I did not know all of that when you were my student there. Um, so <laughs> this is really just wow. Wow, that is a, a, an amazing story. Um, and uh, if I could pick up a couple of threads, one very clear, the impact of um, your faith on you. That is just uh, huge. The other one was that I was deeply impressed by this. Um, you really got at the whore, core of one of the um, major kinds of understandings in, in, in therapy. And you got, I picked it up from Viktor Frankl, um, uh, who is absolutely one of my favorites in A Man's Search for Meaning. It's just a powerful, powerful book. We and, haven't spoken about that either. That's, you know. <laughs> no, no, I had no idea that you liked Viktor Frankl. But Viktor makes it eminently clear that it is not the situation that you're in, right? Because they can take everything away from you. Everything that everybody calls freedom, they can take that away from you, but they cannot take um, away your ability uh, and your attitude, how you're going to look at that situation that you're in. That is probably the most powerful freedom, right? The right. ability to see the very same situation. And you eloquently said this, that instead of seeing that situation as overwhelming threat, you began to see it as overwhelming opportunity, right? And that transition um, because of uh, being attached to these transcendent values that your faith gives you and truth and knowledge and all of those kinds of things, you really had, um, had freedom. So if I could zero in on that classroom um, and that uh, psychology class, when they asked me to teach introductory psychology, which I already was panicky about there because I 
I don't teach introductory psychology, and then that I'm going to be teaching it in a maximum security prison, I'm like, my, the first words were, oi. Okay, so I was uh, just kind of <laughs> surprised about that. And I'll never forget when I heard the clank of those gates the first time that I went in there. <laughs> I went, oh my gosh. You what I just... behind these things, right? <laughs> 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 well, I hope nobody gives me an orange jumpsuit and I can't get out, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was kind of scary, but you know what? Um, it was uh, the men like you and that group of guys, and I often wonder what they're doing now, who um, really were just the best students that, that I ever had um, and uh, would ask for me to give them more, more stuff to study. No student does that, right? No student does that. And the other thing that they wanted me to do was to begin to teach them about REBT because that's what I what I practiced and we role played it and did everything else. And I remember as a student, because the heart of REBT is exactly what you learn from Viktor Frankl and that you learn through your faith. It isn't the situation that you're in. Of course, situations matter, right? They do matter. Um, but it largely, it is the, our attitude when and our thoughts when we're in that uh, situation, the meaning that we give to that. And the, and the significance. And so I want you to share a story you told me about how, and this is just so preeminently true for the you guys, was how you took what we were learning in the classroom about REBT and you actually kind of became an ambassador and was using it to help other students. Do you remember the story I, you told me? Yes, it, 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 right and during the course uh, of that semester, of course, uh, is when this opportunity came to exercise it in a pretty what would have been a stressful situation. And if you can imagine being woke up about one o'clock in the morning <clears throat> by banging on the door, get up, get dressed, everybody file outside to stand on the sidewalk in front of the dormitory, now in the prison, in the middle of the prison yard. So what they would do is they, they would call it a surprise shakedown because it didn't make much sense if they told us they were coming, if the guys had things they didn't wear, you know what I mean? So they would catch us unaware in the middle of the night and line us up out there. And knowing they were in there, they, and while we were lined up on the sidewalk, we're watching them bringing things out, throwing them on the ground in front of the dorm. So we don't have a lot in prison, but a few things that we do, they, you know, we, they mean something to us. So I don't have to tell you that emotions weren't starting to get high. So some of the guys were really grumbling about uh, who do you think they are? And of course, you know, the, the activator here, the activating event, of course, is them being basically right. Uh, it's just, uh, making us feel as if we didn't matter was part of it. Uh, yeah, just prison stuff, you know what I mean? We're constantly, in one way or another, sent signals that we don't matter. And, uh, of course, now, when we get to the to the, the belief part of it, which is, goes back to what Victor Frankl was talking about, I had a choice, though, within that, as we all did, on what I choose to believe about that situation. Right. That I could awfulize it and make it become extremely angry or full of rage like I had many years before in my response to uh, affronts like this. But instead, I remembered the, the model that you had shown us that, you know what, this is bad, but it's not the end of life. It's not a catastrophe here. It's something we're going to get through. We've seen it all before. We know they have a job to do. And I began to share that with a couple of the guys that were really, I could see them getting their blood pressure rising in the course of it, you know. I said, we'll get through this, you know, and I became kind of a calm and influence through that. And then the outcome of that was nobody really uh, escalated anything or, or, or caused themselves any undue hardship like consequences because we chose to look at it as this is going to pass, you know, and we can get through this. And it reminds me of a little, of a little boy, you know, told by the doctor when he swallowed the nickel, this too shall pass. It, it's very <laughs> similar. <laughs> um, and the, the point being that we don't really have to dwell in this moment and things nothing tends to remain the same we can move forward and we, we got through it before we'll do it again and so here it was though, right on the tails of you teaching this a couple of weeks prior and so a wonderful opportunity to share with others the need sometimes to you know that word perspective is a wonderful word it comes from a latin word it actually means to look through not to look at and I always connected that with God's ability to see the end from the beginning. So he's always working things for good 
and where we're where we're heading. We can't see it, but we trust him in faith that he's walking us through something into that end result that he has for us, and always for the best result. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's a, a perfect example of the REBT model that we're talking about. But, I, you know, the other thing that I learned about many of you guys um, was the key role that you guys played in the prison, because we know that the suicide rate can be really high, especially when guys first arrive, right? And um, And that often you guys would be able to connect with those individuals rather than, you know, us egghead mental health people. And you would go in there and you would be sitting with them and doing the suicide watch and they would open up to you. And so you learned those skills and through your life experience, through your faith, and also what you pick up in class. So, you know, um, a big mazel tov to you guys for doing, uh, you know, doing doing that and and playing a key role in the like, in the prison, so that people can also learn. amazing too. Steve is that though we went to school forty hours a week full time, that was our employee while we were there at CIU in the prison. We would we would go out at night and apply what we learned. So we would prepare lessons and go out and share the gospel. In my case, a lot of testimony to the guys who just came into prison, broken, lost so afraid not knowing what to expect piled in a cell sometime with two other guys and here we come around at night to share the gospel and to be able to bring some hope and some light to their darkness you know and so it's a wonderful program and then as you said as we would transfer to other prisons we'd actually be used uh as counselors and etc to speak uh to be a presence in those guys lives you know to uh kind of give them some some confidence that they can go forward and looking at guys like myself at that time, 30, 40 years in prison, you know? Yeah. A quick, uh, quick story, Jimmy. I taught uh, again this semester, but you know, since we couldn't go in, I had to record the lectures and then send those in and we exchanged that. Okay. And um, so I was doing that. I was recording the lectures and uh, which is hard for me because you know how I am when I lecture, it just becomes a free for all. And so, um, <laughs> But they said somebody told us that we need that you um, need to do some REBT training for us. And I went, who? Because it's a whole new group of guys. And okay. so um, I found out that that information came from someone by the name of Jimmy McPhee. And so, um, <laughs> so I'm like. Oh, really? Now I have to do double work because of Jimmy McPhee. Not only, not only did he ask all kinds of questions in class, now he has me doing more work. But I wanted to thank you because um, I got to do more of that with those uh, the new guys there. Jimmy. You do a wonderful you. job with it, too. Thank you. Well, th thank you. I um, really would like, we have a few minutes left, but I'd really like for you to share what you're doing uh, now. And... Um, and um, what, what, what your hopes are, and, um, and then a little bit about um, how people can get a hold of you if, they, if um, they need for you to talk or anything else, right? Well, as I said, I was paroled 13 months ago on April uh, the 27th. I was actually released. I was paroled in March, six weeks to clear all the paperwork. But I was released to what they call the Jumpstart program. The Jumpstart is a rehabilitation reentry program. It begins with a 40-week intensive course on the inside, going through the Purpose Driven Life book by Rick Warren. And we come together in small groups and instruct the lessons. We, through mentors, we work through uh, different idols maybe we've created over time, maybe busyness, uh, maybe some addiction problems, maybe with cigarettes, whatever it may be, and work through it until they pass the course through a pretty stringent uh, survey or a, 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 it's a, it's a five-part Basically, I'm thinking of the word you have to pass, but it's kind of an assessment. I like an assessment. Thank you. Yeah. And it, whether, whether it's blue or green folder that you get and you would pass upon that pass. Then when you are released, whether it's by parole or you actually finish your sentence up uh, without parole, you could go to their housing and what they provided for both me and for 10 years. Imagine I taught that course on the inside. It took me that long to actually be released and have a chance to uh, to enjoy all the wonderful things they have for you. From a wonderful warm bed at night in a nice house with 
a, a kitchen stocked with food, surrounded by, by several other guys working in teamwork, from preparing meals to uh, learning, taking classes together, getting your driver's license, identification. These are things that people don't understand when you come out of prison. If you don't have that kind of support to guide the way, actually the recidivism rate, people returning to prison is 50% within three years for most prisoners across the United States. In the Jumpstart program, the percentage is 4%. In other words, one out of two go back without Jumpstart, one out of 25 that actually go through the past the uh, course and the assessment and then walk out of Christ-centered life surrounded by wonderful people to show you the way. I spent uh, one year in that program, uh, gradually going through, uh, and, but, and I'd like to tell you a little bit of what that journey has been for me. I began to speak as soon as I got out, sharing in churches and then youth groups and said my story, as you just heard. And as time went on, I actually formed a ministry through the prompting of others on the Rock Ministries. I have a board of directors of seven wonderful uh, people that guide my way, give me a lot of counsel, and especially a threefold mission that, I, that I've, I've established, and that's to share the hope of the gospel through my testimony with whoever I can. Because I like to add this too. You know, Steve, when I made parole on March 18th of last year, I had a conversation with God that night. I was so blown away. I just, you know, they told me forever, you never see the outside, Jim. And God said, you know, he said, with man is, with man is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with him. And when I made parole that night, I said, there's two things I want to do. I want to spend the rest of my day sharing with the world that mercy that judge asked for 45 years ago and just how you did it. And the other thing, I sure like to see the world. I've seen it through books, magazine, and, and television for the last four and a half decades. And he's doing that slowly but surely opening up the doors for me. I've crisscrossed the state of South Carolina sharing my story in churches and youth groups and various other places. In fact, I'll be in Columbia this week coming uh, to share down there in one of the churches. But more than that, I, what I've done you know, with the ministry is establish a way. I sent, uh, actually, if I, I can show you this here, 8,000 of these brochures, my life story, sent into the prisons at Christmas time as the message of hope to the ones I left behind. And that's, of course, uh, one part of my of my uh, story is if of my mission is to bring light to the, those that I left behind. And the third part is to reach the at-risk youth with my story. That gap of teenage years there, the so many, the turbulent years and the mixed up years that led me from honor roll to death roll. Uh, I, I want to, if I can prevent one, then I feel like that I'm doing the, the, the ministry assignment, the, the mission God's given me. And imagine this in January, uh, less than eight months after I was home, I was ordained as a minister here in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And one month subsequent to that, I was hired as the corporate chaplain here in the upstate. And I basically get paid to walk alongside others and help ease their walk in life, doing with, with, a, with a basically a mission of two things, to seek opportunities, permit their permission to talk about Jesus and be a friend to others. It's just amazing. And the training that, Everything that I had from CIU all the way back to the, the mentoring and tutoring that I did on the inside, it all translates, Steve. It's beautiful. My life is so rich now. I'm living it. I'm in my own living my, my living room here is where <laughs> we're doing this. And I haven't had a living room of my own since I was a kid. So, it, you know, it's, I, I can't tell you how full of joy I am. And, and I think the joy is rooted in this right here. I often say this, that our joy is rooted in a grateful heart. Every morning I get up and I thank God for the little things that he's given me back. I may seem insignificant to others, but they're everything to a man who never thought I'd see the outside or given opportunities to bless other lives, to leave them a little bit better off than I find them every day. That's my life now. And I'm so full, so full of gratitude and so full of joy and just what you got for me, God, when I get up in the morning, let's do it. You know, I'm ready. <laughs> and uh, what a blessing life is. You're a wonderful example of Victor Frankl's men search for meaning. You know, you took yeah. that life of, with abundant thread and and now see abundant opportunity and you're acting upon that out of the yeah. values and the faith that you have. And I thank you very much. And so um, we will talk and you uh, said that you'd be willing for people to re out, reach out to you. So at the yeah. end of this video, 
I will have a, a, um, a slide that will have contact information so they can reach out to you if that's okay, Jimmy. Right. On the rock, jimmy.org is the website address. What do I know about websites? Just wonderful people God's put in my life to show me how to do these things. It's amazing. And if I like, Steve, if, you, if I may, could I take a few seconds and close with a few verses of the 40th song? Good. It speaks so eloquently to my story. And uh, I'd like to close with that, if I may. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and put their trust in the Lord. And the first few words of the fourth verse say simply, how happy is the man who has put his trust in the Lord. Thank you for this time, Steve. My Thank pleasure, you. Jimmy, and all the best. And we'll talk again, okay? Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to it. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.